All right, greetings. So I'm picking up exactly where we just left off in the last video. So in the last video, we worked out our expressions for the fugacity of component i in an ideal solution, right? And that's the equation that I'm staring at right here. And so what I want to do next is we're going to take this and we're going to, quote unquote, derive Rayleigh's law. Okay, and so I'm just going to continue from the same notes so they're, they're all still together and we have this equation here, okay? And so I want to next derive Rayleigh's law. Okay, so Rayleigh's Law is probably an expression that you used frequently in your mass and energy balance class. Okay, let's show you where it comes from here. So in terms of Rayleigh's Law, right, what am I trying to model? Right, I'm trying to model vapor-liquid coexistence. Right, so I have a multi-component system at vapor-liquid equilibrium. Okay, now I remember that my criteria of phase coexistence is I have equality of temperatures, equality of pressures, and then the fugacity of each component in each phase is equal. So in terms of driving Rayleigh's law, I'm going to start with my isofugacity equation for component I. And so if I do that, okay, I'm going to start with the fugacity of component I in my vapor at Tp, and I'm going to use Ys for my vapor phase, is equal to the fugacity of component I in my liquid at Tp and Xi. Okay. Cool. So you write my equality of fugacities. Okay. Then the next thing we customarily do is we expand our fugacities. So we're going to be a little bit limited here because we haven't done a tremendous amount with, with liquid phases. But in general, the general protocol is I write my equality fugacities and then I expand my fugacities. Okay? We're going to take a slightly different approach here. Okay? But I'm going to expand my vapor phase. right? I'm going to play with that one first. So I'm going to expand my fugacity my vapor with respect to my ideal gas reference state. Okay? So, I'm going to, so first I'm just going to play with the vapor. Okay? So I'm going to take my vapor. Tp and Yi, and I'm going to expand my fugacity using an ideal gas reference date. So the fugacity of component I in my vapor phase is going to be equal to Viv at Tp and Yi times Yi times P, right? Yi times P, right, is the fugacity of component I in ideal gas state, okay, or an ideal gas mixture. All right, so I expand my fugacity of component I in my vapor phase, right? And again, I'm going to reiterate, right, part of the you know, one of the main advantages of using fugacity, right, and expanding my fugacity is on both sides of my equation, I'm going to end up with terms which are explicit in composition, right? And as a chemical engineer trying to solve separation problems, right, what I'm interested in are the compositions of my phases in equilibrium, right? So it's hugely beneficial that I can actually get expressions that are going to be explicit in the quantity that I'm trying to solve, okay? So I start by expanding the fugacity of component I in the vapor, Okay, and then next I'm going to make my first assumption, right, in my derivation of Rayleigh's law. So my first assumption is I'm going to assume that my vapor phase can be treated as an ideal gas. Okay, and so this one is usually quite good. So we're going to assume that we're at sufficiently low pressure so the vapor phase could be assumed an ideal gas. This is one that we'll use a lot. The, and, you know, again, if I think about separation, so when I'm operating a distillation column, my dis distillation column typically operates near ambient pressure, right? Otherwise, I'd have a much more expensive column that I'm trying to pressurize or pull vacuum on, okay? And so typically, assuming the vapor phase is an ideal gas is reasonable. The exceptions to the rule are going to be if I have uh, components that are known to associate in the vapor phase, so such as uh, acetic acid, and then, right, I might need to... Um, correct my vapor phase fugacity by calculating my fugacity coefficient, say, via a cubic equation of state. Okay. Okay. But, all right, I'm going to assume that my vapor phase is an ideal gas. If I assume my vapor phase is an ideal gas, that means phi IV is equal to 1, and I'm left with just that the fugacity of component I in my vapor at Tp and Yi is equal to Yi times P. Okay. All right. Now, in terms of my liquid, Okay, so again, in general, right, I would expand my fugacity. We don't have gammas yet. We haven't talked about non-idealities in liquid. So I'm just going to jump right in with an assumption. And the assumption we're going to make, which is going to be assumption two, is that our liquid phase is ideal. So we're going to assume that our liquid is ideal. Okay, and so if my liquid phase is ideal, okay, then we could expand it out exactly using the equation I just derived. Okay, that's right up here. I'm just not going to write all the functional dependencies, and we'll assume it's incompressible just for the sake of this. 
Okay. So if my liquid phase is ideal, well then the fugacity of component I in my liquid, Tp and Yi, oh, Tp and Xi, use Xs for my liquids, that's going to take the form of Xi times Vi sat at T, and this is Pi sat, so that's the fugacity of pure component I at saturation at the same T, times Pi sat at T, times my pointing correction. Okay. Now using the same kind of you know justification that I just mentioned, you know, typically most of the processes we're interested in are operating at low pressures, right? So, you know, part of the reason for expanding my fugacity like this is yeah, I, I now have a term that's explicit in, in X in composition, but I also have you know this in a form that I can make some systematic approximations. Right? So the first is, we've already mentioned that if I'm at low pressures, well removed from my critical point, we can typically assume my pointing correction is negligible. So if I'm looking at vapor liquid coexistence at one bar, right, it's going to fit the bill of being at low pressures, well removed from the critical point, right? unless I'm you know, doing some sort of crazy uh, separation processes, right? with some compound with a critical point close to one bar. Okay? So I'll be able to assume that my pointing correction is negligible. So assumption three is I'm going to assume that pointing, pointing, and actually pointing <laughs> is negligible. Okay, negligible, right? So if I can assume my pointing correction is negligible, right? That's this term in brackets is zero. So the exponential of that term right, is approximately one. Okay. Then the next assumption I'm going to make, assumption four, is well, if I look at this this first term, then, right, we've already assumed that my vapor phase is an ideal gas. Okay, so it should be reasonable to assume that, if, you know, so thinking about what I have, um, so if I have vapor liquid equilibrium at, you know, 298 Kelvin in, in one bar, okay, this would be pure component one at saturation, right, at the same T. Um, but at its corresponding saturation pressure. So just to draw a picture, so let me think in terms of a PXY. So if I were to sketch a PXY phase diagram, okay, just to kind of remind you of what we got. So for binary system, this would be P1 sat. All right, here's P2 sat. All right, remember liquid up top, vapor down here. Okay, so this is P2 sat. Okay, so what I'm looking at is, let's say I have two-phase coexistence, right, which would be at this corresponding P. Okay. So when I look at the fugacity of my liquid and vapor, right, it's, this is the fugacity of my liquid at this pressure, right, this pressure of interest, for which I've drawn my isobar here. This state here, right, phi I sat times pi I sat, right, if this is component one, that would be the fugacity coefficient of pure component one, right, at the same temperature, but at its corresponding saturation pressure. Okay. Or if it were component two, right, it would be exactly this point. Okay. So if I'm thinking in terms of PXY, this, right, VI sat times PI sat, that's exactly the fugacity of component one here, or fugacity of component two here. Okay. So if I've already assumed that I have an ideal gas here, right, then it should be reasonable to assume that I have an ideal gas at my two endpoints. Okay, so assumption four is that, you know, pure I at saturation at T is also an ideal gas. Okay, so if that is the case, right, then that's just taking or saying that phi I sat is approximately equal to one. Okay, so if I put it all together then, what I'm left with is the fugacity of component I in my liquid phase at TP and XI it's just equal to its mole fraction times its saturation pressure, pi sat, right, at T. Cool. So if I put it together, okay, so putting it together, what we're left with is that yip, the fugacity of my vapor, is equal to xi times pi sat. And this is your good old friend Rayleigh's law, which you would have used in your mass and energy balance class. Okay, so this is essentially my isofugacity equation, right, applied to my system at vapor liquid coexistence, 
which assumes that my vapor phase is an ideal gas, my liquid is ideal, my pointing correction is negligible, pure component I at saturation of T is also an ideal gas. So with those four approximations, I end up with Rayleigh's law. And so if I think back to my mass and energy balances where you're typically applying it, is you're typically operating at low pressures. So assuming that my vapor phase is an ideal gas, right, is, is reasonable and my pointing correction is negligible. And then typically you're thinking or working with chemically similar molecules, like mixtures of alkanes. So if I have a mixture of alkanes, right, all of those interactions are going to be exactly the same, right? An alkyl group interacts with an alkyl group, whether it's in hexane or octane. And so that these assumptions are all reasonably satisfied, which leads to Rayleigh's law. And just a, you know, kind of a last note before we, you know, apply it, it's, you know, remember, it, it, it is important to remember that, you know, Rayleigh's Law is making assumptions, okay? Um, in terms of which ones are, are most likely to break down, okay, is again, for many of the cases that we're interested in, we can assume the vapor phase is an ideal gas. Assumptions to that rule are going to be components if, you, if they're known to associate, Okay, then we will need to account for vapor phase um, idealities via this fugacity coefficient, right? And so, you know, my process simulator, or if I'm using an excess Gibbs free energy model, is going to use modified Rayleigh's law by default. So I would need to know if I would expect deviations from ideality in my vapor phase so I could tell to compute it, okay? Um, so that one, you know, sometimes, right, but isn't overly common, right? So if you have known nasty vapor phases, then, then that'll be important. Um, one that's, you know, most likely to be violated is this assumption that my liquid phase is ideal. Okay, so this is, you know, most typically the case. Um, and so we'd correct for that using an excess Gibbs free energy model, which we'll look at in chapter 12. So assumption two is the one that's most likely to, to be violated. Okay, beyond assumption two, right, next in line would be assuming the vapor phase is an ideal gas, right? If I have acetic acid, right, then I know I need to apply a correction. Acetic acid is known to form dimers uh, in the vapor phase, right? And so you, can, you can't assume that there are no um, intermolecular interactions if, if the component's dimerizing in, in the vapor phase. Um, but then often we can assume that pointing is negligible unless I'm operating at high pressures. Um, and assumption four, right? If, if we can assume the vapor phase is an ideal gas, then it's reasonable to assume that pure component I, at uh, the vapor at saturation, right, that can also be treated as an ideal gas. So that's that's Rayleigh's law, right? And you know the beauty of, of expanding my fugacities and working with fugacities is we end up with these equations that are explicit in composition, right? And you know the significance of that is that's exactly what I want to to be able to compute here. Okay. All right. Now I won't hit you with it here. We'll we'll get in one of the example problems because we'll have seven Rayleigh's law examples to look at. Okay, but what's going to happen is when we use Rayleigh's law to uh, calculate the equation for our bubble line, right, we'll be able to show that for an ideal solution, my bubble line is a straight line. Right, P is just equal to X1. Actually, well, for a binary, let's just do it, right? So for a binary system, what I end up with is if I write down my isofugacity equation for each component, it would be Y1P is equal to X1 P1 sat, then Y2P is equal to x2 times p2 sat. Okay. And so the key is if I just add them together, okay, this is called my bubble p calculation. Okay, p is the same. The pressure is the same in my two phases. So I end up with y1p plus y2p, and that's just equal to p times y1 plus y2, which is equal to p. And the right-hand side, it's x1 p1 sat plus x2 p2 sat. Okay, cool. And so the key is, um, is that if I have a mixture of, of composition, of no composition Z, right, and I were to calculate the bubble point, X1 is equal to Z1, right, this would be my equation for P. Okay, so we'll, we'll look at this in an example problem, but that's going to be the equation of my bubble line, right, and it's just the molar average of my pure component saturation pressures. It's the equation of a straight line, which is exactly what we see for an ideal solution, okay. And so it'll be cool because when we have non-ideal solutions, what's going to happen is we'll end up putting, right, we'll have gammas over here to count for deviations from ideality. Okay, and so we'll be able to look at deviations from that straight line in my PXY phase diagram and connect it to gammas and deviations. It'll be awesome, okay? But we have to wait for that fun till, till chapter 12, okay? But that's Rails Law. Hopefully you know where it comes from now. Uh, and then the next task is just to work through some problems. All right, we'll see you in a little bit.